All right, we reviewed the design principles we, and cycle, reviewed project. Browser compatibility issues, we really didn't talk about. Other folders, we really didn't talk about. Wireframe the prototype to finish page, we talked about, and more CSS we talked about. So let's fill in the gap with those other things. Browser compatibility issues. First of all, um, we all know what a web browser is, right? Web browser is the program that we use to view pages on the internet. Uh, Google Chrome is an example of a web browser. Internet Explorer, Firefox, um, um, Microsoft Edge is, is a new one with Windows. Um, on the Mac, there's Safari. And there's really a whole bunch of them. Uh, those are probably the seven or eight uh, most popular ones. One thing that's maddening about web development is that you can't force your users to use a, a specific browser or you shouldn't force them. It always drives me crazy, and, and you saw this more back years ago, several years ago, than you do now, but when you see a page that says, this page works best on such and such browser, I think that's very, very amateurish uh, in my mind. Um, and under most circumstances, you should avoid doing that. You have really no control over how people are viewing your pages. And with mobile devices, it's even worse because they could be viewing them on an iPad or on a phone or whatever. So it's your job as a web developer to make sure your page looks, is functional um, across different browsers. How do you do that? Well, the first thing that you do is you follow all the rules of HTML. That's, that's your best bet of getting a page that's going to be cross-browser compatible. It's following all the rules. You know, make sure there's ending tags, make sure things are properly nested, and so forth. But even that isn't a guarantee. Because browser, people that make browsers, the developers who make browsers are just like you, right? They're human. They make mistakes. So there can be bugs in browsers. In addition, people that create web browsers have a very tough job. Because sometimes they're writing the browsers as the people that are writing the specifications are writing the specifications. So it's like the target is moving. And the specifications for how web pages are to look in CSS and HTML are incredibly long and complex. So it can be easy to miss something or to let something go for a while because it's not a priority and, 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 and so on. Um, because of that, really the, the best way to do this is after you've ensured that you've followed all the rules, you um, test across different browsers. And that's something that you should do, at least across a couple of them. And we saw, um, I think we saw some examples last week of there being problems. As, as we find problems, we'll talk about uh, them, all right, uh, our prototype, uh, um, in, in our prototype and in, in, in our other things. So we will test periodically. One thing that you want to do, by the way, is you want to test as you're developing instead of waiting until you're, you're done with everything and then go and test. So as you're developing your template, test it across Internet Explorer and so on. Now, um, it can be challenging. Um, there are statistics that tell you uh, how, what browsers are most commonly used and the usage percentage and so on. Um, and you can some, how you sometimes use that as a guide to, to, to gear your testing. Uh, but your goal is to make your page work um, for everyone. That doesn't mean it needs to look identical. There's been cases where I've had a web page that looks slightly different in one browser versus the other, but it was such a small difference that it wasn't worth worrying about and trying to correct. But you do want to make sure the page is um, compatible. So going forward, we will ensure that on different, as we go through different pages. All right. Um, the other thing that I want to talk about is using other folders. Uh, as you can see in our prototype, we're starting to get where we have more than one, you know, more than one file in here. We have HTML files, we have CSS files, we have image files. It's good to organize your files just as you would, um, just as you would um, on your own machine at home and have things organized a certain way. So what I want to show you is how to use folders to organize your file. So let's go and add an image to our 1950s page. Okay. All right. Let's go and let's add a picture of Chuck Berry to the 1950s page. So let's go to Wikipedia. And 
Let's look, look up old Chuck. Yeah, let's use this picture. So I'm going to put it still in my folder, but I'm going to put it in a subfolder underneath it. I'm going to create an images folder here. And I'm going to move the image in there. All right, now let me go and try to add it to the 1950s page. I'm going to start off uh, putting the name, just the name of the image in here. which is not correct because that works if it is in the same page or I'm, I'm sorry the same folder and I'll go and save that and Let's look. We get that, all right? That, if you can look at it closely, it looks like a little crack in an image. So that indicates it's a broken image. In other words, the link is not correct. No, and the reason for that is because our image is not in the same folder as everything else. It's in a subfolder called images, all right? So our page is in this folder. Images is a folder underneath the folder that our page is in. So if you have an image or another file that's in a folder underneath where you cur currently are, you can do this. You can go in and simply put the folder in front of it. You use, always use a forward slash. Some people that have done work on Windows think that you use a backslash, but you don't. Even if you're on a Windows machine or whatever, you always use the, the regular forward slash. All right? You always use that with regards to URLs. And now, it works and we have our image. I will go and give credit where credit is due. Now again, I have, I have another credit, so I'm going to put it in the same paragraph. All right. And there we go. All right. One thing I mentioned was about following the rules of HTML. How do you know that you follow the rules of HTML? Well, you could stare at the page and see if you spot any mistakes, but that's not going to be terribly effective. All right. Interestingly enough, I've been hitting the highlights. I haven't been covering every single little rule about HTML. All right. But just like if you write a term paper, how do you know if you've spelled every word correctly? You could exhaustively look through and stare at the page and see and make sure you haven't spelled anything wrong. But it's nice if you use like a spell check that's built into Word. 
all right, to, to help point things out. There are validators. There are things that are like spell check for HTML. And the W3C organization puts them out. Um, and they allow you to check your page to make sure that you haven't violated any of the rules of HTML. So we're going to look at those. And it's a good idea to do this. And again, it's a good idea not to wait till you're done like I did. All right. I developed all this page and then I waited until I was done. And now I'm going to test it. Well, I'm liable to find a bunch of problems. Right. I hope not because I was very careful in coding it. But it's possible I could develop, uh, I could find a bunch of problems. So let's go to, and let's go and view this validator and see how it works. Again, W3C is the people that are responsible for all the languages on the web. They're responsible for defining um, HTML, CSS, and so on. So I can go and say I want to use the HTML validator. It's off to the side. I can either put in an address of a website, I can upload a file, or I can paste my code into this text box. And that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go and I'm going to select all, and I'm going to copy, and I'm going to paste it into this text box. And I click check. And it gives me one warning. And it says, consider using H2 as top level, he level heading only. What it wants me to do is it wants me to make this an H2 and not an H1, even though it's the, even though it's the top level heading in the section. All right. Warnings are just that. They're giving you advice, but you don't really, you haven't really broken the rule. You've, you've just, um, you know, you've used, the, you've, you've done something that it is questioning whether it's correct or not. Let's go and let's change that, and let's show you if you did it perfectly what it would look like. So I'm going to go and I'm going to make this an H2 in here. And it tells me there's no errors or warnings. So that's like running a spell check and getting it correct. All right. It takes a little while to understand how the, 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 the errors get worded. Let's intentionally break this page. Let me go and let me uh, uh, delete this ending tag here. Because keep in mind this is a machine that's looking through your code. All right. So it's not going to say, hey, you forgot your ending H1 tag. It's going to give you errors phrased in a way that makes sense to the program, if that makes any sense. All right. So I got rid of the end H1 tag, so there's something that's missing there. If I click check, it actually gives me two errors. And if you read between the lines, you can sort of figure out what this is telling you. It says that there is a end tag header scene, but there was open element. What does that mean? Well, it means that, again, I got rid of this guy. It means it, got, it hit to the end of the header section, and yet there was a tag that was open in the header section that wasn't closed in the head, uh, header section. And likewise, it tells us the unclosed element is H1. So that's pretty obvious. Some of those things aren't. Some of the errors that you get are not very obvious. My suggestion, if you run your page through the validator and you have errors that you don't understand, is to talk to me about it. And um, because I've seen millions of errors, um, I can help decipher what it's telling you. All right. There's also one of these for CSS. Um, and we can go and test our page for CSS to make sure our CSS is correct. It works just about the same. It does. All 
So I can go and paste my code in here. And it'll tell me, congratulations, no errors found. Well, that's good. That's excellent. Now, I'll tell you one other thing that this is good for. This is good if, you're, if you have something that is not working in your CSS and you're not really sure why. So for example, a real common mistake is people misspell the word background. All right? They just say background. Now if we do that, of course, that's not going to work. Right? Because it doesn't know, CSS doesn't know what background is. It knows what background is. So I could go and stare at this. I could sit back and stare at it. But you know what? When you make a spelling error like that, or if you've been working on this for a long time, there's a good chance that you might overlook errors that, that on other days that you'd catch. It's good to have a strategy to try to find your problems instead of just staring at your code. Staring at your code is not, definitely not the best way to find your problems. It's best to have sort of a systematic approach. And so what you could do is you could copy this code and run it through the validator. And then you get an error. It does not know what property background means. All right? So that's telling you, background is not the correct name of the property. Therefore, ah, uh, yeah, there's a mistake. And then if I correct that, I'll get no errors. So it's a good idea to run your pages through the validator and not to wait until the very end to run through the validator, but instead, do a little bit of coding, run it through the validator, test it across browsers, and then continue on. The one thing that I found that, that many people that develop web pages and any kind of software are weak in is testing. All right? um, they do a decent job, but uh, you know, maybe developing the pages, but sometimes the testing is a little slack, so they will let errors slip through. And again, remember that most errors uh, in software are not errors where it blows up every single time, but under certain circumstances there can be a problem. All right, let's continue on looking with this. We developed a prototype last week um, that contains these pages, and we first did our template, and then we went and created our HTML, our CSS. We cloned the pages, made alterations for them, and now we have a prototype. We have a couple of different pages here. Now here's where the fact that the CSS separated is really nice. Because we could actually make several prototypes and show them to our customer, whoever we're developing a web page for, and they could tell us if they liked it or not. All right? They could tell us which one they like. So we could develop a prototype that looks like this. We could then go simply by changing the CSS and create a brand new look for the site without changing any of the HTML. Because remember, the HTML is the content. That content's going to stay the same. We're simply going to change the way it looks. And that's a real powerful thing to be able to do. Now, we study the box model, which, which talks about block tags as having a width. They also have a height that you can set. Uh, a lot of times we don't set the height. We let the height set automatically. Remember that the way your page looks depends both on the CSS code that you write and the browser defaults. So we don't have to set everything about the box, all right, or the block. We can set the width, for example, and let the browser figure out how big it needs to be, how tall it needs to be, all right? Um, the one thing that we have not dealt with, though, is the position of the blocks. By default, the blocks stack just on top of each other vertically. So if we look at this page, Header, nav, section, footer. They just stack on top of each other. Now, we went and changed, and we put like margins and borders and widths on these things, but they, they still stack up in the default order according to the browser. All right? 
according to the browser defaults. They stack up on top of each other. So for more involved, and that for simple layouts like this, for smaller web pages, simple layouts, that might be okay. But when you get larger web pages, you might want to have more control over the layout. So you might want a wireframe that looks like this. So that's what our next task is going to be. And we're actually going to look, for, look at several ways to accomplish the same thing. And we'll talk about the respective advantages and disadvantages. We might want a page that looks like this. Has the banner on the top, has the navigation there, has a section there, which is the main article, which is going to be different for every page, and then finally has the footer. So right now the page looks like this. We're going to rearrange and take those same elements and just move them around to have a more involved layout. All right? And there's several ways that we can do this. All right? The first way we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about four different ways to achieve layout. Relative positioning, absolute positioning, fixed positioning, and then finally floating. First one we're going to talk about is relative positioning. With relative positioning, you can take any content on the page and set it to, to adjust based on where the browser wants to put it. All right? We can move it. So in other words, the way this page is set up, the browser wants to put this one here, this one here, this one here, and this one here. We can tell the browser we don't want this one here. Instead, we want to push it over to the right and push it up or push it down. So we can say, browser, take where you're going to put this and change it a little bit by pushing it a little bit to the right, a little bit to the uh, up, a little bit down, or whatever. So let me show you what I mean. So I'm going to go and I'm going to make a copy of this. And we'll change even more of the CSS, but let's, our first task will be to change the layout. All right. So I'm going to go, first of all, first thing I want to do is I want to make this navigation be oriented vertically and be like this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into my CSS and I'm going to give this a width of let's say 200 pixels. You get rid of the margin. I'm actually going to get rid of all the margins. We might add them back in. All right. Well, we made it there, but these are still oriented horizontally. How do I change that? Well, remember, how did we make them? We said we wanted a display of inline block. I'm going to get rid of that. 
So now, these lengths are stacked vertically. All right? Let's say we want to get rid of those bullet points. We can do that by saying, oops, nav ul list style type none. So I got rid of the bullet points. Maybe I want a little space between these. I could say margin five pixels. All right. Now, what do I want to do with this? I want to move this over and up. Over and up. So how do I do that? Well, I can use a relative position to do it. In other words, this by default is how the browser wants to put this content. I'm going to say this, however, I want to be pushed from the left, say 200 pixels, and pushed up, let's say 200 pixels. So I'm going to say on my, on my section, position relative. Position relative means take where the browser is going to put it by default and make an adjustment for that. Push it from the left over 200 pixels. We'll start out just doing that. So take where the browser is going to put it, which is here, and push it over 200 pixels from the left to the right. So it pushed it over. All right. 200 doesn't look like quite enough. Let's make it 250. Now, we also want to push it up some. All right? So, I'm going to say top Let's say I put 250 pixels here. This isn't correct by the way. This is not correct. No, it is not. It pushed it from the top down 250 pixels. If we want it to go up, we have to put a negative number in there. So I'm going to say top negative 250 pixels, and that will push it up. All right. Let's go negative 300 pixels. too far. Huh. All right. And I'm going to push the navigation down a little bit by saying That push it down. We could fiddle with this to get it look exactly the way we want. Again, here's the key. When you say relative positioning, you're saying take where the browser wants to put it by default and make an adjustment to it. And if we say left, 
That means push it from the left to the right a certain number of pixels. We could also say up by saying top and use a negative number. Now, now this is still way down there, so we have to do the same thing here on the footer. Position relative. Um, top negative 310, let's say. We could fiddle with this to make it exactly right, but you get the idea. That's one way that you can adjust um, the position, the default position of the browsers by using relative positions and push things to the right and to the left. I don't really like this technique. I think it's kind of kind of funky to, to put in a negative number to push it up and things like that. So I usually avoid this technique. But I do think it's important to go over it because, you know, it's, it's like another tool in your toolbox. You may have an occasion where this will work perfectly good, so it's good to know how to do it. In addition, you might be working on a web page that someone else has developed, and you might be making changes to it, in which case it's valuable to know how this works. You can sort of do the same thing by putting in margins and putting in negative margins. That's another way I've seen this done. Um, so like, for example, instead of saying position relative, I could, I could have given this a margin of 250 pixel, pixels at a top margin of negative 310 pixels. And it would have pretty much the same effect. And I like that way even less than doing it this way. All right. Um, but again, it is a technique that, that we can use. All right. The next one that we're going to go over is called fixed position. Fixed position is where you are essentially gluing down something to a specific spot on the page. All right. You can specify a position from the top, from the left, from the bottom, or from the right. And most of the time we use top and left. And this is almost like in the old days when you did layout like for uh, a newspaper or a magazine. When I, was, when I was younger, years ago, we did, uh, I was on the school paper, all right? And what we had is we literally had a big sheet of paper like this that represented our page. And if I had an article, I would literally take glue and glue it at a certain spot on the page and say, that's where I want it to be certain position from the top, a certain position from the bottom. Then we sent this off to the printer and they printed the newspaper. All right. Fixed layout is a lot like that. You say specifically exactly where something you want it to be on the page. All right. I'm sorry, that's not fixed, that's absolute. Absolute layout is where you do that. So let me go and let me make another copy of this. All right, and let's accomplish a similar thing except using position of absolute. So I'm going to go here. One thing with relative, the one thing that makes it a little simpler, and I think the reason that people like it, is you only have to put in a relative position for the things that you want to change from the default. With fixed, you put a position for everything in. All right? So that's the one sort of reason why I think people like relative, is that you don't have to give everything a position. Just the things that you want to change the default of. Whereas with fixed position, you give everything a position. So I'm going to give the, the, the top, the header, a position. Absolute. Absolute means glued down. 
from the top, 10 pixels, and from the left, 10 pixels. I'm going to get rid of all the positions from the previous example. So I've said I want this glued down, the header. 10 pixels from the top, 10 pixels from the left. Let's look to see what we have so far by me putting in a position for the header but for nothing else. Got a little overlap there. All right. When you give something a position of absolute, it takes it out of the flow. So if you, that's why you got to give everything a position when you use absolute. Otherwise, you're going to have things overlap. So it put this there, the rest of the things it used the basic flow method for, so it just lined them up starting at the top of the page. So when you use absolute, one of the drawbacks is, well, you kind of got to go and give a position for everything. So, let's go in, and now I'm going to give a position for the nav, and I can say, I want it to also be 10 from the left, but let's give it 200 pixels from the top. I can't see it because it's sort of overlapped, but it's a little low. Let's go 100. Let me go give a section and The footer. So, a couple things off. Okay. And maybe I want to push this up a little bit. Um, so let's do like 570. All right, so there we have that sort of layout. And again, notice what I did. I gave a top and a left position for everything. I can give widths, I can give heights also. I mean, you can sit down with graph paper and lay this out exactly if you want to. I'm do, I was just sort of eyeballing it just in the interest of time. All right. And again, we could fiddle with this to make this a little neater if we wanted to. We could put margins on here to push it over a little bit, um, and so on. But that's how fixed works. You define position absolute, then you could define typically a top and a left for everything, for every, every one of the main blocks on the page. Now notice, when I'm doing position here, I'm not doing every single thing on the page, right? I'm letting the browser defaults take over for the stuff inside of it. So, for example, the paragraph here, the list here, I didn't do anything about the position for that. It was completely fine just to position this big block and let the rest sort of just go from there on its own, all right? So you don't have to put a position on every single thing. You can put a position on the main blocks on your page and sort of let the browser defaults take over for the rest of the stuff on the page. All right? 
and that's a, that's a nice um, little technique that you can use. Um, you know, where, where you don't have to go and manage every little thing on the page. All right. It's funny, you know, um, by not managing every little part on the page, it's, it's really a, be a better situation all the time because the browser will typically do a good job positioning stuff inside a container like this. All right. It's less work for you and then less that you have to change. So again, focus on positioning the main elements of the page and uh, don't worry about every single little element. Now again, notice how quickly, and again, we were a little sloppy about this. I haven't gone and made these look line up precisely and exactly right. But notice how quickly I took the one page I had and made variations of it. And I could show my customer then and say, which one do you like better? Do you like the navigation on the side? Or do you like the navigation on the top? All right, do you like this one better? Or do you like this one better? And again, I'm only changing one small part of it. I'm only changing the layout. But you could change everything about it. You could put a different font on the, on the other style sheet. You could use a different background image or no background image. You could change the color scheme. You could change everything about the CSS and give the person a good set of alternatives so that you can show them, the people that you're developing the site for, you can show them a couple different alternatives and let them select among the one that they think looks the best. Or maybe they'll say, I like the colors on this page, but the font on this page, or something like that. In which case, you could go then and take pieces from your CSS file and, and, and post, paste together sort of a finished CSS file. The next one that we're going to do, any questions about what we've done so far? The next one we're going to do is the position fixed. Now, I, I, I get confused about these. Sometimes I, sometimes I mistake, uh, I get confused between fixed and absolute. Here's what position absolute means. It means that as you scroll the page, everything stays fixed with relation to this top corner of the body of the web page. So in other words, as I go off the page, those things move with it. Another thing I can do is I can lock down the navigation, for example, so it stays there no matter how much I scroll up or down. All right? And that's kind of neat because the navigation then stays fixed and the user doesn't have to scroll to get to the navigation. So that is a position of fixed. And so let me go and make another copy of this. Actually, I'm going to start prototype one. give all these a different margin than what they currently have. I'm going to give them a margin of 250 pixels instead of auto. Now it's pushed over 250. 
And notice as we scroll, the content scrolls, but everything moves. What if I wanted to put the navigation here and lock it down so no matter how much I scrolled, it stayed in the same place? I could do that by saying navigation. I'm going to get rid of the display inline block so they're stacked vertically. And I'm going to say the nav section has a width of 200 pixels. Position fixed, top 10 pixels, left 10 pixels. So now it's like that. Notice I didn't have to touch the other elements of the page. That's what's nice with letting the browser do its job and letting the browser position everything. All things equal, the less work you do to achieve a certain effect, the better off you are, right? Because for one thing, you know, who wants to spend hours working on something? If you can do it with a couple lines of, of code, um, then that's better than writing tons of code. It's better the first time around, and it's better if you have to go back and change it later on. So all things equal, the less code that you write to accomplish something, the better off you are. And one of the key things of writing less code is knowing the browser defaults and knowing how the browser defaults work. Now, because we said position fixed, I'm going to make this window smaller. Notice as I scroll, the navigation stays in the exact same place. So that's a nice effect because it, let's imagine we had a very, very, very long page. If I scrolled all the way down there and I had to scroll back to the top to get to the navigation, well, that would be a hassle for the user. So instead, by keeping the navigation fixed here, the user can scroll as much as they want and they still have the navigation available for them. All right. So we've studied three techniques so far. One is relative. Relative and fixed both sort of work together with the flow method. For relative and fixed, you let the browser defaults handle the positioning of most of the stuff on the page, but you then tweak a couple of things. In the case of fixed, you can sort of glue something down so even if the page scrolls, it doesn't move. Um, in the case of relative, it will position things um, and it will perform some small adjustments on the flow model to move things either to the right, to the left, to the top, or to the bottom. Let's look at this in Internet Explorer and see if this works. It does. The reason I wanted to test that is I remember years ago, uh, Fix did not work in Internet Explorer. Fix worked the same as Absolute. So if I scrolled, it would have scrolled off the page. Which, again, it didn't work identically in both browsers, but it was workable in both browsers. So there was really no need to worry about correcting that. But now apparently they fixed that bug in Internet Explorer. Questions? over any of this. Let's look at some of the relative disadvantages and advantages of these things. With the absolute positioning, the disadvantage is that the layout is fixed. It's glued into place. So if you have a big screen or a little screen, it's glued into place. All right. Its advantage is if you have a very intricate layout that you want to have complete control over where things are positioned. It works to your advantage then. 
if we look at some of these layouts in CSS Zen Garden, some of them are very, very intricate. Not necessarily this one, but let's find one. Actually, probably, in, probably none of these look like they're fixed. I'm, I'm mistaken. Well, trust me on this. If you have a very intricate layout where you wanted to position things exactly in a certain position and you did not want that to vary with the size of the browser window, you would use absolute positioning for that. And again, the, the time I would think you would want to do that is if you had a very intricate design where things had to be in a certain position. Relative positioning is good where the flow model basically works but you just want to tweak a couple of elements to push one to one side or push it up or push it sideways or whatever. So if the flow is basically correct, but you want to alter it a little bit, use relative. And fixed is used if you have something on the page that you want to keep on the exact same spot on the page even when the user scrolls. All right. Those three techniques are relatively um, less flexible than the last technique that we're going to study. And we'll at least start this technique today. And I don't know if we'll finish it or not. It, I, I guess it depends on, on how it goes. Um, but this, this is called floating. Wow. And floating is kind of confusing at first. Um, it takes time to sort of get the idea of how it works. But once you do, you see it's very powerful. And it's very powerful when you start getting into things like uh, developing a web page that's going to look good both on a mobile device and on a uh, uh, desktop device. All right. So instead of doing a version of the prototype, we'll do that in a few minutes here. But instead of doing a version of the prototype, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start a brand new example just to show you how floating works. All right. So I'm going to go and just create a page that has two paragraphs on it. And for simplicity, I'm going to keep the CSS in the HTML document. Again, you normally it's better to have an external CSS file, but 
In this example, I want to have all the code in one place so it's easier for us to see. All right, here's our page, and there's no CSS associated with this at all. It's simply a page of two paragraphs of Greek text. How are these paragraphs going to stack up on the page? There's no positioning in the CSS, so how are they going to appear on the page? Well, the, the block model is going to be, and they'll just be stacked up on top of each other. That's true. Yes, it is. So if we look at it, there they are. Stacked up on top of each other. If I make the browser window smaller, bigger, and so on. Now, we learn with the box model all the things that we can do with the paragraph. So I want to put a little bit of styling on the paragraph. One thing I do, uh, I talked about debugging your CSS code. One thing that's sometimes useful when you're debugging your CSS code is to put colors in, even if you're not, even if you're going to remove those colors by the time you're done, right? Um, so you could put colors just to sort of visually uh, get a, a clearer view of where the certain boxes are on your page. All right. So I'm going to say a paragraph, and I'm going to say paragraph, and I'm going to say a width of 300 pixels. So now they're not going to take up the entire screen. They're going to take up 300 pixels, but they're still going to be stacked on top of each other because I haven't done anything about the position. So I've affected the width of those blocks. But I haven't done anything to change the position, therefore they will stay stacked vertically. So let's go and look at that. Sure enough, there you go. All right. All right. Now, what if we wanted these side by side? How could we put those side by side? Well, there's a couple ways we could do that. All right. Let's think about the ways that we've learned so far that we could do that. All right. I'm going to throw out fixed, right? Because we, st we want this to scroll. So we don't want anything in a fixed position. So we'll throw that one out. I could give a margin of this one of 200 pixels and give a negative margin on the top and push this guy up that way. I could do the same thing with relative position. I could say relative left 250, top negative 250. Let me just do that. I could do that. Make it 350 pixels. And that puts them side by side, right? Because I adjusted the flow using the relative. But what if we added a third thing that we wanted side by side? Or what if the width of that changed? We used a percentage. So instead of a width of 300 pixels, we used a width of 30%. Then we're going to be off a little bit. 
a certain width of the screen is going to be correct or close to correct, but at other sizes of the screen it's going to be off. The point is, is that with relative positioning, it can get a little, little uh, difficult to know the exact values to put in. And it's, again, like I said before, it's not really extremely flexible. Here's where the float comes in. First of all, with the float, I don't have to address the paragraphs differently. I can simply say both paragraphs I want to float left. So let's put 300 pixels float left. And we'll see what that, that, that means. If I do this, it's going to put them side by side. But let's make sure we understand what the float means. Oops. All right, they're side by side. Now watch what happens as I make the screen narrower. All right, they're side by side, side by side, side by side. At a certain point, this guy jumps down to be underneath it. Now that looks weird, right? <laughs> but it's actually very effective. When you are talking about um, having a page display both on a desktop device and a mobile device, all right? One of the things, if you've done a lot of uh, surfing the web on a mobile device, one thing that you'll notice is many web pages that are multiple columns on a desktop version are a single column on a mobile device. Single column websites are easier to read on a mobile device than multiple column websites. Simply because usually you have the page, you have the phone in portrait mode and you're scrolling through it. To have things side by side, there really wouldn't be a lot of space to, to put a lot of content in. So it's better to have one column. Here's the way the float works. If the, there's enough space to put these side by side, the browser will. So how much space does it need to put these side by side? Well, it needs 600 pixels, right? Because there's two paragraphs. Each one of them is 300 pixels wide. So here, I would say the, the screen is about 900 pixels wide. So 900 is big enough to put these two paragraphs that are each 300 pixels wide side by side. There's probably about 700. Still enough space. When I get down to here, where I'm at maybe... 550, there's not enough space to put 300 plus 300, so it drops the second one below. Sometimes these are called liquid layouts. Um, liquid uh, meaning um, like liquid takes the shape of the container that it's in, right? I mean, if you had a bottle of Coke, it, the Coke is shaped like the bottle is. If you pour that bottle of Coke into a glass, that Coke is shaped the bottom, you know, has now has the shape of the glass that you pour it in, right? So these paragraphs are sort of like that. The page takes the shape of the container, that is the window. So they sometimes call these liquid layouts. Now, this is a very basic example, and we can sort of figure out at what point they're going to be side by side, and at what point they're going to be on top of each other. Anything bigger than 600 pixels across are going to be side by side because there's enough to put 300 pixels plus 300 pixels and put them on the same line. When you think of floating left, essentially what that means is push it as far as the left as you can. All right, Stay on the same line and push it as far to the left that you can. And if there's enough space, put it there. If not, then drop it below. Now, thing to remember is if we add things like margin, borders, and padding, that's going to add on to the total width of the thing. So if I put a border of 
10 pixel solid red. A margin of 20 pixels and a padding of 10 pixels, then actually at about 760 pixels it's going to drop below. Why? Because something has a width of 300 with 10 pixels borders, that would be 320 pixels, right, because there's a border on the right and left, plus a 20 pixel margin on the right and left, plus a 10 pixel padding. So that's going to add up. So if we look at this, now we have that. So it's going to drop down at a much wider width. We used to be able to get it all the way to there without it dropping down. Now if we get to there, because of the margin and the padding and the border, it causes it to drop down alongside of it, uh, you know, at an, earlier, at an earlier time, at a wider width. Now there's some other curveballs in here. What if we put a percentage in? All right. Now you might think, well, if I make a percentage of 40%, then no matter how small the window gets, there's always going to be 40% of that width. So you might think that it's never going to drop down. Well, it will, because we still have the border to take into account, we still have the padding, we still have the margin. In addition, it's not going to break a word in half. So it's not going to get any smaller than, the paragraph's not going to get any smaller than the longest word or however big the window and the tabs are. So if we do that, notice as, whoops, It's bigger, we make it smaller, make it smaller, <laughs> and at that point it drops down. We can also specify a minimum width to say never make it smaller than a certain amount. So I could say 40% and a minimum width of 350 pixels. So there it dropped down even earlier because it won't make it any smaller than 350 pixels. Notice without that, it will continue to make it smaller until it gets real, real, real small. Without that minimum width, if I resize it, it'll make it smaller, 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 until it can't make the window smaller anymore. Yeah. This is a pretty cool combination that you can put in. That will, that, that will handle most situations like with mobile phones is using a percentage along with a minimum width. All right? Because then, if it can put them side by side, it will. If you get to a smaller, it will, but it won't make it so tiny that the columns are real, real, real thin. If we added a third or a fourth paragraph, it would still work the same. Everything would still work the same. Now, I'm getting a little ahead of myself because I'm talking about mobile development. And we'll cover mobile development um, maybe next time. 
I'm not sure. We'll, we'll, we'll have an intro on mobile development. But built into the Chrome browser, there is a mobile emulator. All right. What's a mobile emulator? It allows you to sort of see what your page is going to look like on certain mobile devices. That way you don't have to go and buy one of every kind of phone to um, make sure your page works across all the different mobile devices. How do you get that? You click this. You click to more tools, developer tools. And then you click this little guy here. And you can say, I want to view what it's going to look like on a Nexus 5X. Or a iPad. Or whatever. Let's go ahead and change this a little bit. Make a minimum width of 450. There you go. And on the Nexus, it would put it on top of each other. Now, one thing that you notice, you might notice, is it's very difficult to read. All right. Um, even imagining if this is a phone. Um, one thing that you want to put in, there's an extra sort of thing that you can put in um, in your HTML page, which deals with the viewport, which sort of helps it get the right size. put this using a meta tag and you put it in the head section. So now it looks more like it would be readable uh, on, a, uh, on, on this particular device. And it really doesn't have any effect on the page within the browser. So side by side, we make it smaller. It drops down. If we were to view this then on a mobile device, we can see how it would look. Simply by selecting the device toolbar and picking a particular device. That's an iPhone 5, iPhone 6, and so on. Questions about floating. Keep in mind that these are all things that you should try for your labs and experiment with and play with it. Uh, on, on a number of your labs, I ask you to make two versions of the same page. Um, try to make them as different as possible. So don't just use different colors or different fonts or whatever. By all means, do that. But also do different layouts. Do one with a floating layout, one with a absolute layout, and so on. All right, let's talk about how we're going to make our page using a floating layout now. We're going to, do, we're going to accomplish sort of the same look that we had using a floating layout. All right. If you remember, the page that we want, the look that we want, is like this. All right. So, how can I do this with a float? Well, 
I can make this guy 100% of the width. Okay. I can make this guy 100% of the width. That's cool. And we can float both these left. I can make this, let's say, 20% of the width, and this 60% of the width, and float these all to the left. So what should happen is, this is going to take up the entire line going across. Because if this is 100%, there ain't no room to put anything alongside of it, because it takes up 100%. If this is 20% and this is 60%, it's going to fit side by side. Well, maybe, most of the time. And then finally, if this is 100%, this is going to uh, fit uh, on a line by itself. So let's go and let's build our prototype to look like the absolute and to look like the relative, but using the float. And one thing I think you'll see is we can achieve sort of the same thing we did with the absolute and with the relative using the float. And the float, even though at first it seems more complicated, the float is actually a lot easier. All right? So let's go and do that. I'll make another copy. Header. I'm going to make width of 100%. I'm going to float left. I'm going to get rid of the margin, at least for now. Navigation. I'm going to make a width of 20% and I'm going to float left. I'm going to get rid of the display inline block because I want it to be oriented vertically. All right, so all I did was put a width and a float left on all these things. The header, which I wanted to be go all the way across, I made a width of 100%, same thing with the footer. The nav and the section, which I wanted to be side by side, I gave them a width of 20% and 60%. That should push them side by side. Let's go and let's look at what this gives us. Looky there. Notice a couple things about this. Are these off a little bit? Remember when I did the relative, I was playing with pixels. Well, let's try 350. Let's try 360. Let's try 362. And I never got it exactly right. All right? Let's go back and look at one of those. See, there's a gap there. There's a little bit of gap there. Um, I think three was even worse. Oh, 
no, not three. Um, prototype one, there you go. Yeah, I notice that these aren't even and so on. Whereas when I use the float, I get it lining up really, really nice with a very minimal amount of effort. Remember the, the rule I said sort of before, that if you can accomplish the same effect with less effort, it's probably a better way to do it, right? Because, hey, it's less effort. It's easier, all right? Makes sense it would be better. And um, it's then also easier to change. Now, you might say, well, what if I want a little gap between here? Well, gap between things is what? A margin. So I could put a margin on a couple of things here. Put a margin on the bottom of 10 pixels. On the footer, I could put a margin on the top of 10 pixels. Yeah, there yeah, spaces it out a little bit. I want a margin in between these. I can do a margin left on really any of these. Margin right actually on this one. No, that's that is margin left. My mistake. That puts a little space between it. So again, notice how neat that is. Now you might notice that actually this scrolls off the page. Or again, remember that the padding and the margin and all that add, adds up. So I wouldn't necessarily make it 100%. I might make it 95% if I wanted to be a little real neat about this. Or let's say 90%. So now there's no horizontal scrolling. As I make this smaller, I'm always keeping the page filled, which is good. So on a smaller screen or a bigger screen, the page is always filled. If I hit a certain size, it drops down and becomes single column. Now notice that that poked out of there a little bit. I could get rid of that issue by putting a minimum width on the nav. So I could say minimum width say a hundred pixels. On a very narrow screen, I got a single column page. On a wider screen where there's more real estate, I have a multiple column page. We're heading into the area which is often known as responsive design. All right, Responsive design is sort of like I said, liquid design or flexible design, whereas the page responds to the size window that it's on and also responds to the device that it's on. That's why floating is sort of uh, a really good way to go in many, many, many cases. The others have their places as well, but most of the sites that I would do, I would use a floating layout, simply because that puts me in the right position to have a page that's mobile compatible. 
Now when we talk about mobile compatibility, we'll find that we could actually use two different kinds of layouts depending on if it's a mobile site or a desktop site. We could use a fixed layout if we were on a desktop site, if, if the user was browsing it on a desktop machine. And then we could use an intricate layout with fixed positions and all that. We could use then a different layout if it's a mobile device. But the nice thing about a mobile uh, or a floating layout is it sort of puts you in the right direction from the start to develop a mobile and a desktop version of the same site. So one that looks well on a computer as well as looking good on a uh, mobile device. Let's go and view this using the emulator. All right. And On a iPhone 5, that's how it looks. On a Galaxy, huh. Well, it shows us what it looks like on, on those different um, devices. Again, it's not necessarily exactly the way I would want it to be, but we can address that um, when we do uh, our mobile optimization, which will probably happen sometime during next class. So my suggestion for you would be on your design for your um, uh, project, uh, which is due next week, by the way, uh, as well as going forward, make sure you get very comfortable with using the floating uh, method. Again, the fix is OK if you want to do one of those. They're relatively easy to do. But once you sort of get your head around the way floating works, floating really is not that much more difficult than a fixed design. And it gives you so much more flexibility in, in designing your page. I want to cover a little more about layout next time. Because today, uh, we, talked about, um, we talked about sort of positioning the big items on our page. But what about positioning some of the other things on our page? For example, here I have the Beatles, Jimi Hendrix. What if I wanted to put those guys side by side on something like that? Well, I could use floating as well. But here I'm floating sort of within a content area. Um, so my focus has been on positioning the big blocks. Um, because really, that's something that, that's sort of your first job. If there's anything else that you want to um, uh, fix a position for or, or define a position for. Um, you use sort of the same techniques, uh, but oftentimes simply using the browser's defaults is often enough. Like, yeah, this isn't bad. But we could possibly do a better job by um, styling this a little bit differently. Any questions about any of this? All right. That's all I had for today. Um, we'll see you over in lab. All right.